Good evening. Hi, my name is Jim McGreevy, and thank you for joining with us here at the Alexander X. O'Connor Auditorium at Bayonne High School. Uh, we're very much honored to be joined by the superintendent and by the mayor as we grapple with the realities of controlled dangerous substances, which are a risk to all of our children. And again, I just want to particularly express my gratitude to uh, Mayor Davis for having this event, uh, for the entirety of the Board of Education and the superintendent for welcoming us here, but to the Bayonne community. Um, again, Mayor Davis has been an extraordinary partner with the Reentry Corporation. I'm very much grateful that he includes our folks uh, within the ranks of the DPW to provide them jobs and opportunities. But again and again, the mayor has emphasized the importance of grappling with addiction. And before we start our program tonight, it's my great honor to call upon our superintendent, somebody who has been not only welcoming, but understands that the entire team is here tonight. And I just want to thank all of those from special services from the board, understanding the importance of addiction treatment, early detection, and recovery. And with that, I'd like to call upon our right honorable, hey, the mayor's here himself, uh, our superintendent to give welcome and then the mayor. And Dr. Zerbo's here from Rutgers Medical School. Here, come on up. And now our superintendent. Thank you, Governor Krieger. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the panel. Thank you to Governor Krieger, Governor Mayor Davis, uh, President Bellotto for um, bringing this issue to the community, the importance of CBS control dangerous substances and the prevalence amongst the youth of the great state of New Jersey and, of course, the city of Bayonne. But uh, my role here is to welcome all of you support the mission and the hard work that you do, the uh, Reentry Corporation does, and, and how we can help. We're 100% on board, and I just, again, on behalf of the Board of Education, I'd like to welcome everybody to Bayonne, and let's, uh, you know, I, I look for a very educational and uh, enlightening uh, meeting, so thank you. And thank you for your courage and, and come before us, and I really, really do respect that. And thank all of you, so thank you. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. And, and before we hear Mary Davis, and I know he's got a big, busy schedule, but we have Dr. Zerbo. Rob, could you pass the microphone to Dr. Zerbo? And so um, this person is literally in the state of New Jersey. Dr. Zerbo is responsible for the Center of Excellence at Rutgers Medical School. When I think of people that are responsible for addiction, addiction treatment. I'm just going to ask Dr. Zerbo, and she's got now, she, she's got a list of assistant professor, Department of Psychiatry, Rutgers Medical School, Director, Northern New Jersey, Medication Assisted Treatment Center of Excellence. She looks, you can tell, she's almost like from Hudson County. She's got five jobs in there. Um, but uh, in a serious way, I would just like Dr. Zerbo to tell us what is the addiction crisis. Just what is it and what do we confront in New Jersey? Yeah. <laughs> and there's a microphone. No, no, there's... Yes. Um, and do you want me to just talk for a couple? Because I don't know if Yeah, yeah, just talk. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think it's really tough. And um, I think the pandemic has actually changed the way that I'm looking at Thank this, you. which I think is so important. Um, and so there's a big focus now on kind of housing, support, and empathy help people and I think what's happened with the opioid crisis which is different from what we saw with the crack cocaine epidemic in the 1980s where that was very much stigmatizing and drug war and let's you know harass and attack minority populations in inner cities but the opioid epidemic now it became everybody you know spread to the suburbs and we saw a lot of white people were using and so unfortunately fortunately that created a treatment response but it was very racially motivated because that was not the answer to a drug epidemic so I think it's great that we have this momentum right now where we're treating this as something we need to sit down with people and understand as a medical disease and treat. But I think we're still far away away from that. Because right now, today, if any of us have an addiction and walk into an emergency room in one of the hospitals in New Jersey, nine times out of 10, you're not going to get treated well, you're going to have a bad experience, people are going to be nasty to you. So in our healthcare system, we have a very serious problem where we're still not treating people with addiction as if it's a medical disease. 
And to me, I think that trickles down then throughout the rest of society because if doctors aren't doing it the right way, how will lay people know how to help someone with addiction? And then on top of that, we have the war on drugs. So we have over 100 years where we made a small subset of substances illegal. And we said if you use those things, even if you didn't hurt anybody, you didn't try to sell it to anybody, if we just know you put it in your body, we're going to come and arrest you and put you in jail. We're going to take away the good things in your life. You can't get educational loans. You get a drug try. It's like a nightmare. And so the, the society that we've created right now has this heavy prohibition and illegal cast over it for these drugs. And then people that use them, we like punish and harass and shame them. And people who get addicted get addicted because they're in pain, whether it's emotional or something going through, they overuse something, and now they find themselves in this downward spiral. So I think, especially with the pandemic, and this is 2021, right, like this income inequality is not out of control in this country, like we just have to step back and look at this larger picture, and especially for our kids, it feels counterintuitive, but the most important thing is to be open about it, and not have punishment, people don't get in trouble. Um, one of the moms we work with talks about how her son, when he got in trouble with drugs, and he was off all the sports teams, he wasn't allowed to do extracurricular activities. Like when we kind of target and label adolescents as drug users, we actually create a new spiral for them to go down. So it gets real complicated with this type of topic, but I think we need to kind of think about it very broadly and think how can we help people and support them to be empathic and just get away from this mentality of like catching people, gotcha, you're in trouble, punishment. Like that's prohibition stuff that has always been racially motivated and we just need to end that kind of approach to it. Thank you. And I just want to let the mayor know we're going to be on our Facebook Live right now in terms of NJRC. And thanks to the superintendent, we're going to be on Bayonne Board, Board of Education and also the city of Bayonne. And with us, I, I just want to ask him, he's kind enough to stop by, he's a very busy schedule. Um, but he's somebody I'd like to call upon to say a few words. Uh, he's the mayor of the great community of Bayonne. And when Rob Porter, our director of operations, and we work with the mayor, and we employ folks uh, through the mayor, through private employers, and there have been times where people have said, we'll employ your folks, but there's been a challenge with addiction. And the mayor has made the importance of reaching out to the community, reaching out to parents, reaching out to the treatment community, and so here tonight, in addition to Dr. Zerbo, we have representatives from Hudson County, we have representatives from RWJ Barnabas, representatives from Bayonne and the treatment community. And so the person who brought us all together, and not only does he understand this because he was a police officer for many years, he understands the struggle that Aaron talked about, but as a father, as a husband, he cares about the community, he's seen people struggle. I'd like to call upon a few words, and I know he's got a very busy schedule. The great mayor, Jimmy Davis. Mayor? Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I promise to be short, and I'll put it as bluntly as possible. You have to speak to your children. You have to speak to your family. You have to speak to everybody about drug addiction. I lived in for 28 years as a police officer. I've seen relatives, I've seen friends, and I have seen the children of the same become drug addicts. We went through a period where everything was illicit. You know, you would buy drugs off the street. Then we came into the area of Oxycontin and Oxycodone. And we were getting it prescribed by doctors and churning out a whole nother level of heroin users. And everybody turned a blind eye to it, a, a blind eye to it, until it got so out of control. And I can tell you flat out, there are doctors I've arrested for just pushing pills. But we cannot stick our head in the sand anymore. First and foremost, you have to speak to your children. I have three boys, 30, 27, and 14. And I speak to my 14-year-old every single day about drugs and alcohol. It's not a joke. Your child can do it once, and 
end up an addict for the rest of their life. They can do it once, not like it, and never do it again. But if you don't speak to them about it, and don't talk to them about peer pressure and everything else, there's, they're going to find out on their own. They're going to take their own path. But sometimes by the time you get involved and by the time you see the signs, it may be too late. So doing this here today is for everyone to understand what's really going on out there and to understand that it's us that need to help them. But we also have to learn what the signs are. And we also have to learn what to do when it happens. So thank you for being here today. And I will leave you with this. If anyone ever needs any help whatsoever, just show up in my office. We will start the process right then and there. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mayor. And I, I just wanted to say what Mayor Davis has done is that if anybody has any concerns to contact the mayor's office, and within 24 hours, we will have that person in detox or in residential treatment or in IOP. So please contact the mayor's office. Our commitment, New Jersey Reactive Corporation, is that within 24 hours, thanks to Mayor Davis' leadership, we are committed to treating. And I just want Mayor Davis, Rob, if you could just share your story uh, with all of us and uh, just the highlights because we want to get on with our evenings. No. Lights. There are many highlights. So, sorry. Go ahead. So, um, so, um, yes. Yeah, so my father was in the North Farm for 37 years, right? And uh, I remember when I was a kid, he used to come home. He used to tell me stories all the time, all these horrible things that he saw, and and how some of his friends had sons, and they, they were they did, and you know, the trouble they got, and ended up. You know, Dosing and all this other stuff, and I, I grew up with that idea in my mind of how I, I used to see the look in his eye, how scared he was that that was going to happen to him. So, like, when it started to happen, I was so afraid to go to him because I felt like I had let him down. You know, and like, um, and my father was just doing what he felt was best, but you know, when he gave me said, like, you know, speaking openly you know, to your parents, to your children, you know, could and will go a long way if they ever do decide to make a poor decision and a mistake and they end up going down the wrong path. I went down the wrong path from age 13 until I got clean when I was 28. And, um, you know, locked up as a juvenile, locked up as, a, as an adult, uh, in and out of different facilities and treatment centers. And, you know, if life was fair, I'd be dead. 30, 40 years of prison, you know, but like, you know, I, I was given an opportunity to, and a gift of willingness, really, you know, to, to try something different this last time. Um, and, I, you know, I joined the 12-step fellowship, and, and I recommitted myself to uh, to helping others. I, I got to be honest with you, that, that's, that's the one thing I can honestly say that's safe, you know, being able to help others has, has kept me along, that, along the path, which is why I didn't want to get an opportunity to speak like this as much as I hate speaking public, you know, and, and uh, I tell them my story, you know, whatever that is, like, I, 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 people did it for me when I was struggling, and, uh, you know, the things that they said, I picked up on the little things that I could identify with, and I held on to that, and that gave me hope that maybe I could turn my life around one day, and, and you know, not go back to doing the things that I always did, and, you know, I'm the director of operations for the New Jersey Venture Corporation, I work for the wonderful James McGreevy, every single <laughs> day. And both of our forests, it's like my brother, but um, and I'm also the director of addiction services. And, and as Jim said, we can place anyone in treatment within 24 hours, you know, whether it be detox, residential, or intensive outpatient. We can also connect them with medically assisted treatment if that's something that they need. And, you know, it's, it's so, as Jim was saying, so critically important to turning people's lives around and getting them on the right path. You know, because if you're not clean, the likelihood of you getting a job and turning your life around yes. is soon to come. So. Thank you. And now we're going to have Marco. Marco, you're going to have, to have a chance to say thank you to the mayor. Thank you, Mayor. And tell him why. You really helped me um, a couple of times. Uh, thank you for uh, showing me what's right and what's wrong. Um, my story, I feel, is like everyone's story. Uh, got into a construction accident and um, wound up taking Oxycontin, and I didn't know what it was. Became a slave to it for about six years. Um, the last time I, I mean, it got so bad where I was on 50 pills a day, 50, 30s, half an ounce of coke, 
I was ready to kill anybody for my next, you know, how. And um, I got two kids. I got a 14 year old daughter and a 9 year old daughter. I ain't never want to see anything like that. And um, during the process, I lost my father. He told me to just uh, enter into rehab, and he died 10 days later. After that, I just balanced myself and to God. It didn't change. And look at me now, I'm okay with it. Reverend Bolivar Flores, Governor James McGreevy, Mayor Davis, his entourage. Um, and well, you're not out of the auditorium yet. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what you said about going over to the mayor's office and, and, and bringing someone, giving them some help, that, that right there is such um, I had actually somebody from Atlanta County come up here and I went to put them in a rehab this morning. Uh, went all the way to Brooklyn because there was no services around this area uh, that I grew up. Um, but I did take them into my home, gave them clothes, uh, haircut, food, and I'm going back tomorrow to Jersey City. But being here now, I can actually extend my network and figure out a solution to this, this dilemma. That so if you know somebody, give that person to Rob Carter, and Rob will make sure they get into treatment and they get provided for housing and the wraparound services that Dr. Zerbo spoke about. Right? Absolutely. So it's good you take them home, but you've also got to connect them to treatment, treatment, treatment. Yeah. But I just wanted everybody to understand that that Marco, we were we were up in, in the court and it got a little hairy. Uh, the judge was great. I'm happy to be a big fan. He's, he's, but um, it helped that Marco had taken uh, a couple pictures with the mayor. You know? Yeah, that did help. <laughs> a lot. A lot. A lot. A lot. We, we threw your name around quite a bit, Mayor. We didn't hear exactly the mayor got the call. But it's good to be looked at in a different light. And, um, like the gentleman said, you know, if, if you're on drugs, there's no way you're going to do it. Um, I stayed drug free. Uh, I even got my mom into, into rehab, and now she's a, 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 I don't, I don't, an addiction specialist. She, she was yeah. you know, on, on crack cocaine for about 30 years, and once I got out of rehab, I put her in rehab because I became the chairman of the facility. Um, this, is, this is my story, and uh, I want to thank you all for being here. And, Thanks, Marvin. Robin, can you just talk a little bit about what's going on, Robin? Yeah. Hey, you just got to talk close to the mic. I'm sorry. Yes. Hi, everybody. Uh, Robin James from Hudson County Department of Health and Human Services. Can you talk a little closer to the mic, Robin? Oh, sure. Thank you. Take it off. Yeah, it's great. Okay. That's great. So I work for the uh, Hudson County Department of Health and Human Services, and we do a variety of services at the county, but we'll talk primarily about uh, mental health and substance use services since this is what the panel is about. So the county does a lot. The county actually does a lot of planning where we talk to residents, we look at data, we sort of see trends, and we see patterns of behavior. So can I just jump in? What, what do you see as trends? Uh, okay, so trends that we've seen in the last years, we've seen increase in poly substance use. We've definitely so seen- So I'm sorry, Rob, can you, for the average person, what's the increase in poly? Poly substance use, meaning the average person who's using substances is usually using more than one. So you're using more than one substance. So what does that mean? Can you give us a couple examples? Sure, where you, know, you could be using uh, benzodiazepine, you could be using heroin, you could be using um, cocaine, you could be using crack, you're not just using one substance. So why, why, why are more people using multiple substances as opposed to just one substance? Why is that a, for lack of a better word, or a trend, or more? I don't know if I can answer why that's happening. I can just tell you that's what we've that seen. That is happening, okay. Yeah, and, and what we've seen, which I don't think anybody would be shocked to hear this, everybody has heard about fentanyl. So fentanyl is an additive that's showing up in multiple substances. Sometimes people are using it knowingly, that it might be placed in their substance. Sometimes they're doing, uh, using it unknowingly, and that's increasing the overdose deaths. Our office, what we try to do is we try to determine what the needs are, and we try to. So when you're talking, Rob, when you're talking about the overdose deaths, what are you seeing in Hudson County? Well, we see. Interestingly, we ran stats before we came here. In Thank 20, you. In 2020, compared to 2019, overdose deaths have stayed constant, but there's also been a lot of activities. One of which we've been doing a lot of work around Narcan. 
we've been giving Narcan, there's been a lot of Narcan distributions. So what I'm saying before is the county does try to stay on top of trends and anticipate what needs are and implement services and programs to sort of help. Can, can I ask you to pass the microphone to Dr. Frank right next to your left? So, but what do you see, and I just want to pick up what Robin said, is, I think it's terribly important, is fentanyl is in everything. What do you, what do you see? Yeah, um, fentanyl is, um, it's rampant. It's not a, some, you know, when you would think of an opiate user, or if someone asked you in your mind to picture what that and, and the addict to look like, you wouldn't have a conception uh, it's you know someone who's homeless and you know, warming their hands over a garbage can and a fire. And that's not the case. Um, it's sad to say that the age of use for an adolescent is probably early onset, like 12. 12 At what? 12 years old. 12 years old. Experimentation, sure. And I, I think when you see a spike and increase of probably substance abuse is because all of these drugs are readily available. So you see 12 years old. Can I just jump to Kevin? No, you can keep the microphone, Frank. Kevin, grab the mic. All right, so Kevin, what do you see? I would, I would concur. First of all, my name is Kevin McCorchick. I'm a program manager for, manager for uh, Barnabas. Uh, for the Institute for Professional Recovery. Um, now that you got the advertisement out of the way. Uh, well, that's how I click my check. <laughs> so, um, so what do you see? I just want to pick up on what Robin said. Trends, multiple use, Frank, fentanyl is everything. What do you see? Uh, I agree. Uh, we see the same thing in the, in the hospitals. Um, it's definitely people using way more than one substance. Um, and, and people seeking out fentanyl which surprises the hell out of me still. What does that mean when people are seeking out fentanyl? Um, they're, they're looking, anymore it's harder to find heroin, it's easier to find fentanyl. So, it's easier to find fentanyl than heroin? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I hear stories of people, people paying more just for, just for heroin compared to fentanyl, uh, because obviously the price difference is. But people seek it out because it's a strong drug. You know, just like when I was in my active addiction, I knew somebody fell out using a certain stamp. I was looking for that stamp. When you say, explain what a stamp is. Um, so heroin comes in the little, the little glass. Are you talking to the microphone? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sweating at the same time. Um, so the bag that heroin comes in, it's all, they're all stamped, which marks who's selling it. Uh, uh, and the, these, these stamps are what people look for. So when uh, if I've heard somebody fell out or overdosed on a certain stand, I would intentionally look for that stand. So I'm gonna just ask Dr. Zerbo, Eric, can you explain? Frank, can you pass that microphone up this way? Thanks. Um, what is fentanyl? Great, um, so I think this you is- You just gotta speak close to the mic, Okay, um, I think it's really helpful once you get this part down. Yeah, all the way, thank you, because I'll go back and forth, but I just want, like, the average person like in Bayonne doesn't make me know what fentanyl is. So thank you, I apologize. Um, so all opioids can substitute for each other. So if you're addicted to one opioid, you can use any opioid to feel better. It kind of doesn't matter which one. And so heroin is diacetyl morphine. It's just like a version of morphine and it was produced in like 1898 by a pharmaceutical company. It was marketed as a drug. It was the brand name heroin. Um, and then they found that people were abusing it. They made it illegal in 1924. So heroin has just been like a common street opioid that's been illegal that most people have used. Fentanyl um, is a synthetic opioid, so the structure chemically is entirely different. So it interacts with the synthetic same- Synthetic means it's artificial. It's yes. chemically produced as right. opposed to heroin, which comes from the poppy seed. Exactly, yeah. So heroin you can extract from flour, and fentanyl they make in a lab. So even though the chemical structure looks totally different, it still interacts with the opioid receptor and gives you the opioid effect. But the difference is if you do a urine toxicology and it's only fentanyl, it will actually be negative for opiates because you have to specifically test for the fentanyl. So it gets a little tricky with the toxicology testing. Wait, did you say that? I didn't know that. Can you yeah. say that again? So when you do it, it's um, toxicology screening is its own thing. You kind of have to know exactly what you're looking for. But if you're looking for opiates in the urine, usually that's looking for a morphine molecule. So if you use heroin, morphine, et cetera, that will show positive. If you only use fentanyl, 
we'll see people that overdose and come into the hospital and their urine is entirely negative because we did not check for fentanyl in that urine. Because usually you can send out tests in these three days, it's more complicated. So it will be negative. That's interesting. And so what is fentanyl, doctor? So fentanyl is a different type of opioid, it's a different chemical structure, and it just happens that it's 50 to 100 times stronger than heroin. And then people might have heard of car fentanyl, so there's like fentanyl analogs, there's dozens of them. So car fentanyl is used in veterinary medicine as like an elephant tranquilizer, and that's a thousand times stronger than heroin. And they're starting to see car fentanyl in samples that they're getting on the street. And the general class is called um, highly potent synthetic opioids, so HSPOs, and they're predicting that in the next decade it's going to be primarily the opioid that we see on the street. And so fentanyl. Wait, so what we're going to see on the street is this. Can you say it again? It's HSPO, so highly synthetic potent opioids, or maybe highly potent synthetic opioids, HPSOs. Um, so fentanyl is like one of them, but the other ones are strong. So that's going to be fentanyl, and there's car fentanyl. And there's other fentanyls on top of that, and then there's other types of opioids that are all like incredibly potent. And the, the idea here is that. Can, can I ask you? I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. this is. I, Mayor's here, like, so where does this, I'm sorry to be so, where does this stuff come from? Um, laboratories? Yes, it comes from labs. So like people will say it comes from China, it comes from lots of places. Comes from lots of places. Yeah. And so it's, it's manufactured and then it just gets into the distribution chain and... This is the key. So because it's more potent, you can, like, imagine if you're if you're a smuggler, right? You have to smuggle in this much heroin. If you use fentanyl instead, you can do 50 to 100 times less, right? So you smuggle in smaller quantities and then you can serve the same number of people as users. So there's um, a huge incentive in the black market to have these highly potent opioids. So the problem overall is that, and we know this, like, just the war on drugs does not work, prohibition does not work, the drugs are purer and more available now than they've ever been. And we've had a war on drugs where we spent, I think it's $1.5 trillion since the 1970s. And any, every patient of mine has never said to me, I can't find heroin or cocaine when I go out on the street. And then people are like, I can't get into your treatment program, right? So we have this totally lopsided system where we're spending all this money on like trying to track down drugs and arrest people and stop the drugs flowing in. And we have more drugs here than ever. So the answer overall is that you have to disincentivize people away from the black market. Because if we continue this war on drugs, they're going to continue to profit from these fentanyls. It's going to get stronger and stronger, and we're just going to keep bearing this underground. Instead, we need to, like, and I would say we have to legalize, tax, and regulate all drugs. But basically, we just have to take this out of the criminal element and try to bring it back to the legal market. Because if you keep a black market, I honestly don't know how. So, so and, and could doctor for these... Super, excuse my language, supercharged opioids. What do you do? It's the same thing as what so you do. So it's MAT? Yeah, it's MAT. The Can problem you is what that MAT so, is? Yeah. Um, so these, the fentanyls are, the, in terms of people asking for fentanyl, um, all the, basically all the heroin samples now when they pull it from the street, I think up to 95% have fentanyl in them. So even 95%? Depending, depending on the area. Anywhere from 70 to 95%. So it's like literally everywhere. And we test in our clinic and it comes up and almost every single patient has heroin and fentanyl or some patients have only fentanyl. And some people have no idea they're using it and other people specifically ask for it. But when you start using it, your tolerance goes up. So then you need, so it's not that people, you know, they're chasing like the level of opioid that they need. So That's if you're addicted to a high, yeah. So if you're tolerant to a high level, like you can get tolerant to any level of anything. So it's just over time you still get tolerant. And when Robin talked about trends of poly, whatever, I mean, I don't even know what the word was. Poly but substance. Thank yeah. you. Poly substance. So the, the fentanyl's in everything. Why would people, I'm just trying to understand why people would want multiple drugs. That poly substance data, we've actually naturally never been good about tracking poly substance. In all our research and addiction, we always study one drug at a time. So I think in general, drug users often use multiple drugs. I think that's actually so I would guess that data like that is just picking up, I don't know if they were always measuring for polysubstance and whatnot, but I think it's just more that we're becoming aware now that that's how most people use drugs in the community, and then I think drugs are very available. And how does fentanyl change addiction and patterns of addiction in the community? So obviously much higher risk of overdose death. And um, the big problem that we see also is with intermittent users. So if you're a daily user, you develop a physical tolerance. The bigger problem, I mean, that's a problem because you can always overdose. But people that are like weekend warriors are using intermittently.
elderly or adolescents that are trying for the first time, that's when you get so nervous because even very small amounts, people can have an overdose death. And even experienced users will come out of rehab and they'll try to use a very small amount and they'll still have an overdose. So that's why I think we need to talk about things like being so open, using with other people, being vocal about it. Um, people probably heard, I forget her name, but there was that um, person in the media and her son died and he had like ordered one pill off of Snapchat or something and it was like Xanax laced with fentanyl and he died. And that was like the first drug he had tried, I think. And they, I think they had something cannabis before that. But it's just like, I understand for parents, it must be so difficult. But, but just like Rob was saying, I think sometimes if, you, if you're talking to your kids all the time about how bad drugs are, then like when you were thinking about doing it, when you're starting to do it, then you can't go to your parent and say anything about it. So it's like you almost have to talk about the pros and the cons of drugs and just be open about it and like assume that your kids are going to experiment. And that like experimenting is okay. Like we just have such a culture where we're like drug use is so bad and it's like we have all this moral stuff attached to it. Like a lot of people drink alcohol, they smoke cigarettes, they do this. And it's not to say it's good for you, but like we need to be open right, right. that it happens. But for the parents concerned about these super opioids, um, what do you what do you do? But it's like being more controlling or like um, no, I trying to be in it. Said, it's yeah. not going to do it because like they you know they're not going to be in front of you 24 hours a day. Yeah. So it's having that open conversation to say if he was to order a pill, yeah. he didn't know what it was. He should do it with a friend in the room. So it's right. That, so it's like harm reduction stuff you want to teach them and like how to experiment in a safe way because like they're going to experiment and they'll just do it without you. So to, 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 I, I just wanted to say, Jeanette, do you want to jump in? This is what you do. <laughs> Pull out my phone. There you go. Uh, yeah. So I work uh, for partners. close microphone close. Ah, oh, okay. Good. Uh, I work for Partners and Prevention. So we are a uh, substance uh, misuse prevention uh, organization that works throughout Hudson County. My supervisor is here, Jaisa. Um, so. Yes. So what do you tell what do you tell Mr. And Mrs. Bayonne? I would tell Mr. and Mrs. Bayonne um, the same thing that a few of us have been saying that uh, it is really, really important to have that open communication where uh, young people can talk to their parents about how they're feeling, how things are, you know, the things that they're hearing from school, things that they're hearing from their classmates when it relates to substance misuse. Um, our organization, we work to, um, we have educational programs, so we'll, we come to the schools, we come to Bayonne High School, to the middle schools, and we have programs that we educate. So, uh, so we're going we're to put yeah. all this information up on the Snapchat, we're going to put this, all this information, but I wanted to pick up on what Dr. Zerbo said and what Rob said. Rob said, you know, I heard my parents say ABC, and Dr. Zerbo's response was, well, how do you get to a deeper, more meaningful conversation where more critical information is passed? How do we do that, Jen? Well, <laughs> so... Or anybody else want to jump in? A, Go ahead, Jen. <laughs> it's a, um, a big conversation, but I think that um, it has to be like a, a unified message um, where young people are not only hearing this information when they go to school and they're hearing, you know, risk involved with substance use, um, but they're also hearing this information from their parents. They're also um, hearing this information um, or, or seeing it in the community. Um, so it's, it's open conversations, it's engaging, it's, it's also providing, I know Lisa, thank you for Newbridge, Lisa provides all sorts of information with our clients who are grappling with spot. Did you want to jump in, Lisa? Sure, I mean, thanks. We're coming back to you, you're getting all. So basically, you know, in addition to like also just going back to the polysubstance, um, I think um, just to back up what Dr. Zerbo was saying, I think people have always been using more than one drug at a time, but I also think that, you know, um, dealers are cutting drugs with more than one drug at a time. Typically, that's something with fentanyl that has been like really disturbing from day one because someone can go and smoke weed for the first time and there could be fentanyl in it or take. So somebody could be smoking marijuana and there's fentanyl in it. Somebody could be taking cocaine and there's fentanyl. Somebody could be fentanyl and alcohol, fentanyl and anything. So, so the, the, it goes back to what Dr. Zerbo said, greater awareness to what Jeanette said, greater open communication. So I'm just trying to like be practical. So Rob or Frank, what would you, what should, I mean, your father probably did everything he possibly could. What do you think would have been meaningful to you? 
just for the record, I was hopeless, but um, the hard one. But uh, you know, like exactly, my father was telling me those things because he figured it would scare me, you know, out of doing it. But the reality is, you know, like I mean, I'm not only speaking you know, for everybody, but everybody that I know tried something at some point, you know. And, and some of my friends, they went to their parents and they talked to them about it. You know, they took them down a different path, you know. And I don't know the conversations that the parents had with the kids, so I, I can't speak to that. But I don't know, like there, there were definitely times you know, when I was younger, when I was, you know, before things had gotten really bad, where I would have liked to go to my father and kind of talk to him about it, like, I didn't want to disappoint him. You know, I didn't, I didn't want him to think that he raised one of those people that he told me about, you know, and like, and for me it was more, just for me it was more of an acceptance thing. Like I felt like if he would have looked at maybe understood a little bit more of what I was going to be able to win to do. So I, I don't know what you say to a kid, you know, but I, I just know at that point, like, if, even if he told me all the sort of things we said, but, you know, if you ever, if you ever do this and you have issues, would you just come and talk to me about it? If you would have just said that to me, it might have changed me. Probably not, but it might have. But I, I would say, you know, there's no reason not to tell your children how bad the effects of drugs and drugs are, but to let them know that if they do decide to make a mistake like that and we talk about it, then you wouldn't be more understanding of it. It's not just going to punish them or look at them a certain way. Because we honestly feel like my father looking at me a certain way would have crushed me way more than... than How about person. Marco? Or does anybody have any, you have any thoughts? Um, so, hi, Jaisa Coronado from Partners yes. and Prevention. So I think when it comes to our programs, what we try to do is keep them evidence-based, science-based, because youth are very intelligent, sure. they can check facts very easily. So I think our messaging is generally you want to protect your brain. You're going to need your brain. And when you are an adolescent, your brain, in the same way that you can learn things much easier, like you can pick up on languages and pick up an instrument, it's spongy, it's malleable, and it can be more vulnerable right? to drugs and substance abuse. So we, as a prevention agency, we try to delay the onset of using drugs that you don't Obviously, youth are very impulsive at that age. It's also part of the boys. Yes, <laughs> the lesson brain. I'm not so saying anything not about work out, but I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, speaking to that um, impulsivity, we want to kind of hone in the message that you can wait on this, that there's too much at stake right now, that you want to have as much capacity to but learn. But to, to get there, though, you have to do what Dr. Zerbo said. You have yes. to have that open, honest conversation. And the harm reduction. Right. So, Mark, Mark, would, would that have made a difference, that conversation? Seriously. A conversation, microphone, a conversation talking about the brain, a conversation that was open, a conversation that openly talked about addiction and the harm and, and the consequences and the brain chemistry. Uh, conversation between me and my parents or me and my children? No, no, no. Between you and your parents, between you and the school system. Yeah, if they, if they would have that or, or elaborate that. It, I could have went a different way. I, I like what you said, though. I mean, evidence-based, factually based, kids are more informed. Um, the way it was done with me, well, my parents won't work. Um, but I, I like what you said. Um, I appreciate that. I think um, myself growing up, the messaging was just say no. Abstinence is the way to go. And I think that I, I think that was well intentioned, but I'm not sure it was purely realistic. Or effective. Exactly, especially with the accessibility of drugs in certain neighborhoods with what the plight of urban sort of neighborhoods is. So I think kind of really giving the facts and making it, this is a, like, this is a choice. So when you say facts, life. so like, I, I'm, I come from the school, I remember my mother saying to me, no, and I said, why? No, it was my father, and, and he would say, because I said so. So that, that's that's the wrong, so what kind of facts do you give? Do you give facts about fentanyl? Do you give facts about classes of drugs? Do you give facts about the impact on the, on the brain chemistry and the long-term deleterious effects? Yeah, and when we try to do it so they're like, don't glaze over and get bored, and I think the, one of the more, um, I think, pertinent or significant programs that we do is it's called WNBI, which is we're not buying it. And it's like targeting messaging because obviously for youth, um, we've learned from vaping, which has been, you know, a, a 
right now there's lawsuits because they, we've learned that those certain companies were targeting you. We've learned it with tobacco. We've learned, obviously, that they're trying to target so they can get their customers early. So we tell them they're trying to get you into this path of addiction. Don't fall for it. You're smarter than this. You don't have to listen to those messages. You can make, be confident enough to make up your own sort of so lifestyle choices. Thank you. I mean, so what happens if my son or daughter hasn't heard that message or hasn't bought that message, and now they're using and they're using heroin, they're probably using from what Dr. Zerbo said, knowingly or unknowingly, heroin and fentanyl. What do you do? Um, that's where um, I, I would have to sort of agree with Dr. Zerbo about harm reduction and kind of the, I love to hear that there's programs that are available um, in um, Hudson County. Uh, prior to me working in prevention, I used to work for what was formerly known as diapers. So I worked in child welfare. And I can tell you how many times we had parents that were substance abuse addicted and we couldn't find a program to put them in, to get them that kind of help, even though they were in the most desperate point of their lives, possibly losing their families and looking for assistance and then not putting So they couldn't find treatment. Yes, exactly. So having those resources, ensuring, um, I love all these individuals that are here for- so, And I'm not gonna that. criticize, I mean, both Frank is here, but I, you know, one of the things that frustrates me and Rob is, God bless him, what he does for our purposes, but one thing that frustrates me is people have an addiction for seven months, seven years, 17 years, and we think they're gonna get ready or fixed in 30 days residential program, which is mainly, it's not happening. And that's why, I mean, we practice 18 months, long-term, same doctor, same psychiatrist, and whatever, I mean, the, so can I just go back to, to Dr. Zerbo and ask her, so Erin, if you were to establish best practices, what would it look like in terms of treatment? And candidly, how do I keep that 17-year-old young kid in school functioning with MAT and with life? So um, MAT is medication-assisted treatment, just for everybody. Um, and they're actually changing the wording of it, so now they're calling it MOUD, so Medications for Opioid Use Disorder. Um, and it's basically out of all addictions and substances, there's only three drugs that we have good medications for. So one is opioids, which we'll talk about one in just a second. Um, tobacco is the other one, so like nicotine patches, nicaragua, lozenges, like 95% of people can use those nicotine medications and successfully quit. Um, but they try to quit, it takes a lot of fit attempts. But, um, and then the third one is alcohol, and we have a couple medications for cravings for alcohol, but it's not like super effective, they're only moderately effective. So the place where we're very successful is with tobacco and opioids. And MOUD, or MAT, some people will still call it, is basically three medications. It's methadone, buprenorphine, which is often known by its brain name Suboxone, so that's a pill you put under your tongue. And then the third one is Vivitrol, which is extended release naltrexone, and that one's a blocker. So the same way we use Narcan to reverse an overdose, like if somebody has opiates and they're not breathing, you can spray Narcan into their nose or inject it with them. It's called naloxone as the medication. And that basically goes to their brain and kicks out all the opiates and like blocks the opiates. And so Narcan is the short acting version and Vivitrol is like a month long version. So you can inject someone and then it just stays in their system for the whole month. Methadone and buprenorphine are both types of opiates, but the reason they work as treatment is they're very slow onset and then they're very long lasting. And so when someone takes it for a couple days in a row, you get what's called a steady state in your blood. And when they take it in the morning, like they're not getting high, they're not feeling anything from it, you just kind of stay on it as a maintenance dose. And what we find is that people's brain chemistry reverts to being sober. So even though they're on methadone or buprenorphine, their brain is actually healing while they're on that medication. And if they don't use one of these three medications, we see very high overdose death rates for opioid use disorder. So it's six times greater than the general population, their chance of death. Wait, could you say that again? So if you look at um, people with an opioid use disorder, so if somebody's addicted to opiates, they're six times more likely to die than anybody in the general population. If they're on one of these three medications, they're twice as likely to die. 
So you're still more likely to die than the rest of the population. That's how dangerous opioid use disorder is. And it's literally just because it blocks your breathing, right? So if you go to too high a dose of an opiate, your breathing goes to zero, and then people pass away from that. That's the, the only reason you die from it. Otherwise, opioids actually aren't that bad for your body. So that's why we're able to keep people on buprenorphine or methadone for years, and it's okay medically. The problem is that high dose makes you stop breathing. Um, so it, our huge push at our Center of Excellence is to get all doctors to be prescribing medication like that. So if you have an opioid addiction and you walk into an emergency room, you're leaving with a prescription for buprenorphine because it's great to reverse the overdose for someone, but then they're immediately, you're now in withdrawal. So now they're going to need to go out and use right away. So the thing with opiates is like you need to get treatment that day. So we're doing a huge push to get all doctors to start prescribing these medications. And how hard is it to get this medication? Right now, it's fairly difficult um, because of all the stigma. And so methadone, also people have probably heard of methadone clinics. Um, tons of regulations that was started in the 1970s. You have to go to a special designated methadone clinic and they only open certain hours. And you have to stand in line a lot of times. And they were supposed to re like relax the regulations as the years went by, but they just didn't. So we have this very restricted way that we do methadone here in the US. In other parts of the world, they do it much less restrictive. So buprenorphine is what we're focusing more on, and that's that pill you put under your tongue, and you can prescribe it from any doctor's office, just like a regular prescription. The problem is well, you have to get a special waiver to prescribe it. The DEA can come visit you as a doctor if you are a prescriber of it. And so only like 4% of doctors in the US even have the waiver, and then most of the doctors that have it don't use it. So it's this terrible situation where we have literally over 2 million people addicted to opioids, bunch of doctors that are like scared to prescribe this medication because they don't feel like they're an addiction specialist, they don't want to get involved with the DEA. So they're starting to get rid of the waiver and we're working as a center of excellence to advocate for that, but we're just trying to get the messages out to doctors and get them more interested. So I mean the irony, and you've said this a hundred times, that a doctor could freely prescribe oxycodone but can't and fentanyl. And fentanyl and but can't provide can't provide for suboxone. So what is the what is the gold standard? What should New Jersey and the nation be moving towards on MOUD and prescription and availability? I mean, it should just be available to everyone. So in, in our idea is like there's no wrong door, so you should be able to walk into an emergency room or an outpatient clinic or oh, your care doctor, etc. It depends, there are emergency rooms in New Jersey where you will get a prescription for buprenorphine, so we are starting to move the needle, um, but it's just, we need to do a lot more. Okay, so Frank, what do you see in terms of the street right now? With the challenges, what do you see in the street right now with, uh, and I've had the pleasure of being on your Zoom calls, what are people saying in the, in the street? What's, what are they confronting? Well, uh, first of all, I'd just like to let you know that uh, I'm the executive director of New Pathway Counseling. Uh, we started in Hudson County over 20 years ago. Um, and, uh, Robin was 12 years old. Yeah. Uh, and just to kind of reiterate what the doctor said, um, the opioid, act, the MAT protocol is crucial in, in the fight against the opioid epidemic. Um, the one thing that I'd like to say in terms of the Vivitrol, I mean, if you did have a choice, if we had a choice as a facility, we would try and move everybody towards the Vivitrol uh, because it is a long-acting drug and, and it's a, an injection once a month, as opposed to um, allowing somebody after they're stable to administer the buprenorphine or the subutex for themselves. So there's a little bit of diversion there in terms of not uh, medically complying with the treatment protocol, whereas the Vivitrol um, literally saves lives because it's very difficult to... But, I, but just, in, just in terms of the global though, Frank, can you just talk to me about what are people confronting right now in the street? Well, I understand something. What we're confronting is that we just went through a pandemic, right? Yeah. And as tragic and as confining and, and stressful, the pandemic exacerbated the epidemic. Right, so I can tell you this from an adolescent perspective, we're seeing a high incidence of uh, mental health disorders, anxieties, depression, eating disorders, and, and you know, when you say like, how do you tell your child 
you know, and, and, and educate your child. And, you know, as a parent, I think there's two things that we would all want to instill in our children. Confidence and to know that they're loved. So, but before we get there, I just want to stick with the public health emergency right. and what Aisa and what Dr. Zerbo said. So, you have... We have the kids and adolescents. You have in yeah. drugs. Right. You have multiple drugs. You have a public health emergency. Mm -hmm. um, from what we've seen, a higher level of overdose deaths. And you have the conflation of all these factors as we move into the summer. I mean, summer for me, have a lack of treatment. Understand that the opioid epidemic, 80% of the people who need treatment can't get treatment. Okay, so what we want to say is, is for all those, I mean, for, for Mayor Davis to call Mayor Davis's office and he'll call Rob Carter and he'll make actually Rob work for a living. And, uh, you know, whether it's anything from detox, uh, whether it's residential treatment, whether it's IOP, MOUD, and basically providing assistance. But if all those things are going on, right, and the challenge of treatment, what do we do to tell the family? The conflation of all those forces, families trying to grapple, to not focus on this. Uh, Dr. Zerbo says, you know, it has an honest conversation. What do you do purposefully with your children? As, a, as maybe preventative is the wrong word. What do you do, Robin? What should, what should we be doing? If you're a Bayonne parent and you're watching this on Facebook Live and you hear all this, um, what, what do you do besides pray? So I will give you guys a short answer. If you guys Google risk and protective factors for substance use, you will have a ton of reading of things that help and things that All right, can you, give it? Can, you give, can you give us a few? Sure. Um, off the and top then speak into the mic. Thanks. Bro. Sure. Um, off the top of my head, it's things like having your kids connected to a sport, connected to an activity, having dinner at home, sitting down as a family, things that might seem like we take for granted and might seem like, you know, they're insignificant. They are very significant. So any parents that are out there, Google risk and protective factors for substance use for mental health. You'll have a lot of reading to do over the summer. Things that you can do will make an impact. The other point I just wanted to make, if you would allow me, it's not one size fits all. The yeah. answer is not if someone has an issue with substance use, this is the magic answer. There's lots of points of intervention where we can see there's a, there's a problem developing. So it's up to all of us as a community, to schools, to family, to neighbors, to friends. The other point, it's not just about treatment. Somebody goes to treatment and that's the end of the story. There's lots of things to offer after treatment which are supports. Recovery, when somebody's you know, trying to abstain from substances, there's a, there's a continuum of recovery. Not everything works for everyone. Some people will go through recovery multiple times and some people need extra support after recovery. So it's very important to look beyond treatment and supporting youth and families during the entire treatment, before, during, and after treatment is very important to focus on. So, so when you say that, I mean, so that people can, you know, you're, you're talking about rituals, rituals in life, um, being with a family, participating in sports, building a community, and that, you know, maybe is opening up now in the post-COVID. What do you do um, when the concern, I think that Frank and Kevin was talking about earlier, when people are coming out of COVID with the mental health challenges and the conflation between mental health challenges and addiction? How, how do you help children in those areas? I think the answer would be similar. It's recognizing when things are concerning. Patterns don't just come overnight. Someone doesn't just wake up and suddenly has a full-blown mental health disorder or a full-blown substance use disorder. So I think through what we all said on the, pad, uh, on the panel, education, vigilance, community, media campaigns, it's a lot of different ways to approach this and if we're all paying attention and we're all taking so, so I can get a hold of Dr. Zerbo, because I can get a hold of Kevin at RWJ. How do I get a hold of Robin? How do I, how do I get Asian? And that, and that, how, how do I get a hold of them? Our contact information is on our website, and we the county really tries to be a system partner. So we always have parents, we have 
partners, we have community members calling us and saying, hey, this is happening in my family, I have no idea how to navigate this situation. We say very humbly, we know how to navigate services because that's our profession and we're paid to do so. If it wasn't our profession, we would, we would have a very difficult time navigating services. So if you reach out to us at the county, we'll make sure you have our contact information. We can help anyone and everyone get Thank you, Robert. Services. Thank you. So now we got a young gentleman, um, Alex. Alex, describe what you do for a little as, I work as a uh, peer recovery specialist for New Jersey Rancher Corporation. I've worked as a peer recovery specialist for the last four years in Bergen County. And well, also, I also work as a substance abuse counselor, so I actually wear both hats. And I see the important. Yeah. Substance, so uh, counseling is, you know, the more traditional clinical way of treatment and stuff that, you know, we've been working on for you know, the last 50 years and peer recovery is the idea of I've been where you're at before, I know what you're going through, and you know, let me hear from you what you think is going to be able to help you. At least that's the approach I take no matter what the program is that I'm working on or you know, whatever part of the field that, that I'm working in as far as peer recovery. And they're both important, right? I don't I, I take traits from each one when I'm doing one role as opposed to the other role. Um, I believe they're meant to go together, right? If I'm working as a counselor on detox on the weekends, I'm, you know, talking about the importance of also utilizing another line of support, recovery support. And when I'm working as a recovery specialist, I'm talking about, you know, treatment, 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 because, you know, that's what works for me. You know, and hopefully the person asking me, you know, for my opinion or my suggestion for my story, and that's, uh, you know, just what works for me. So when you see addiction, you talk about it, it, it's a battle. It definitely is uh, trying to, because a lot of the points that were made is, uh, you know, something that stuck out to me that was said on the panel was that a young person's going to do what they're going to do. And I know that to be true because that's what I did. And that's what I saw. And, you know, it. There would, have, there would have been great opportunities uh, while I was going through school and, you know, and even my parents to have those conversations. But to be honest, I don't know if I was ready at that point. Now, that's not the case for everybody, right, because it is individualized. We, have, we could fill up every seat in this auditorium with somebody the exact same age going through the exact, that have the exact same demographics, and we'll get a, single, get a different story from everyone. Um, so when you take, when you look at it, that approach for addiction, you have to look at it with that approach for recovery. Too. So that's why um, I think, while still maintaining that the importance of, of treatment, and you know, this is what this is what we know to work because we've seen it work for so many years. Also, we have this this other line of support too, recovery, recovery support that goes right along with it. So, what do you do about Okay, so uh, I was I was thinking about that when it came up. One of the programs I worked on in Bergen County was one of the favorite programs I got to do was I was talking to a, a health class for sophomores in, inside of high school in Bergen County. And they, they, the whole idea behind it was opiates. It was an opiate use like presentation I was supposed to put on. And I was and it was a really long health class. It was like an hour long health class. I don't remember the class being that long, but 20 minutes into it, I can see people going on the kids going on the phone. No one's really paying attention. What I was saying was going over their heads. You know, heroin, oxycontin. For that class, that individual class, those were really tainted words, and they weren't picking up on that. So I switched directions and I asked them the question: How many people here have tried smoking a jewel before, or tried to drink alcohol? 32 out of 35 kids raised their hand, and I believe that the people didn't raise their hands just because they weren't this. The kids that didn't raise their hand didn't raise their hand just because they weren't this. So then I took that approach and started talking about how, because that, that was my story. So instead of like starting at a certain point with my story about where the opiates is and how my life took this direction where I'm in and out of rehab and in and out of jail, I started talking about before it got all that, when I thought things were all good and things seemed all good. And, uh, and, and how it, it just planted those seeds and how it started and how like growing up and going to school, I really, there was like two different pathways I could I could have taken, and I took that one. And I believe it was because of some cigarettes, drinking alcohol, things that are very socially acceptable. Any other questions? Yeah. 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 Ye
So I guess what I'll, I'll, I'll close on is that what we're doing here tonight with the panel and, and the programs that, that we're making available when, with inside, you know, local municipalities, inside the schools, you know, I've, I've had the pleasure actually of going to be a recovery specialist inside the hospitals, in the emergency rooms. It's, it's definitely high crisis, you know, like you're, you're walking into a situation and somebody's just overdosed and you're trying to talk about treatment and they're really not, they may not be, you know, awake enough, you know, to be able to comprehend, you know, what's going on. Um, but it's uh, it's definitely, a, 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 I look at it as a low enough point to at least start the conversation. Um, I know that laying in the hospital bed myself nine years ago, if somebody came and talked to me, I would definitely listen to what they had to say. Just that what we're doing tonight here with the, with the panel and, and, and having these open discussions within the community, this is what's important and this is how we start asking the questions. This is how we get the answers, even though, you know, maybe like, like we've been doing this for a couple years now in the epidemic, we seem to be getting nowhere. The numbers are, of overdoses keep increasing. Like it, it, it just allows us to continue to have these conversations so that we can get to a solution. Thanks, Alex. Good well job. So, so when Alex talks about this, and, and I just wonder if we're going to go to sort of wrap up. Um, I think one of the things I take away from tonight is. Um, what Dr. Zerbo said at the beginning is that, you know, how we approach drugs, whether it's motivations and the war on drugs and ill-fated, we just celebrated for about 50 years um, of that very expensive uh, era program. But it's, it's what we're doing here, to, to paraphrase Alex, it's an open conversation. And it's tough though, right, because people bring different mores, different values, different understandings. So it's, it's having this open conversation, which in part requires, I guess, a certain faith in the legitimacy of your children listening. Um, and that people, to I should point, are going to be open if it's fact-based. Uh, the children are over, teenagers are going to be open. Um, but it, it's hard, though. It's hard, because I think a lot of parents, myself included, are filled with a certain amount of fear. And like you, you're, you want to do what's right, you want to do what's fact, evidence-based, but you don't know what to take to the next step. So I, I just want to I just sort of go down the panel. I'll start and we're end with the great Dr. Zerbo. I just have uh, two questions. One, um, if you were to, and I really appreciate Robin, and we're going to put up that, that resource. Um, the first thing is, you know, we talk about, and I appreciate Robbins, the do's, I don't mean to say the do's and the don'ts, but, you know, the resources that should be available to a family. And then I also, if you could give advice for the community at large, what should the community be doing? So I heard a lot of it interesting when I hear from Alex, I hear from Kevin, I hear from Marco. Um, you know, to a certain extent, they were running and gunning and doing, you know, whatever they were doing and they were listening. So it was a way to get them to listen. So the first thing is about family, the second thing is about community. So first and foremost, I, 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 it seems like everybody has mentioned the idea of family being so integral to really uh, being that protective measure that is going to um, help that youth perhaps circumvent some substance use that substance use early on because the statistics are so staggering. If you um, start using substances before the age, uh, excuse me, 90% of addicts started using before the age of 18. So, I mean, 90%. So that really sort of speaks to the fact that if we can try and delay onset substance use, there's more of a likelihood that Addiction might not be something that that 
person has to experience throughout their lives. So as we so speak- I'm yeah, oh, sorry, so if 90%, so if you cross 18, did you say? Yeah, so, yeah, so uh, if 90% of addicts say that they started using drugs before the age of 18. So, can, can I, doctor, does that mean that if you're past the age of 18, that your cognitive and your development and your thinking is such that you, you get a pass? Do you, th do you think that if you, if you wait till after 18? What do you think, guys? Um, I wouldn't say on all counts because there's nothing, no assurances in life, but it does definitely help. And I think what the science does say is you're more um, vulnerable to um, having substance use issues later on in life. Sorry. Yeah, I actually usually open with in our biology, so I skipped over this part. Um, so your brain is fully developed when you're 25 or 26. <laughs> so technically you shouldn't do anything that's the answer, no. <laughs> um, but the idea is that it's kind of um, So when you're by that age, what's happening is like your front part of your brain is developing, your back part, and they're, they're developed by adolescence, but they're not connected. So um, your, your primitive cortex is like your deep part like your, in the like inner part of your brain. That's like your drives, your urges, aggression, sex, all your thoughts, impulses, well, not thoughts, it's more like impulses. And then your prefrontal cortex is the top part of your brain behind your forehead. And that's like your rationalization, your abstraction, you're all sitting politely listening to me, that's your prefrontal cortex, you're using your willpower to stay in the chair and like not run around the screen, etc. So the whole point is those areas develop by the time you're an adolescent, but you need your prefrontal cortex to control the urges and impulses coming from your primitive brain. And that takes until you're 25 or 26 technically before it's fully myelinated, meaning those connections are fully there. So what that means is that you're going to see more impulsivity, that if you have a strong urge arising, the person might go to put the brakes on themselves, but literally the brakes aren't as strong until they're 25 or 26. What's so fascinating is the adolescent brain with this weak connection is identical to the addicted brain. So when someone is addicted, it's like they're an adolescent around that particular thing, right? So they'll say one thing and then they go and do another thing 10 minutes later. That like kind of inability to be consistent in a continual narrative, right? That requires the prefrontal cortex to keep helping you make choices and say no to things. And that part goes offline when you get addicted. So the whole idea is you want to catch people in the experimentation stage because then they don't have all this brain dysfunction. If they're coming to you like what Rob is describing and you're already using daily and you're feeling cravings, it's, the key is cravings. If you started to feel cravings and get preoccupied about that substance, now you know that those brain changes are happening and you're starting to have disconnection between the front part of your brain and the back part of your brain. And then those cravings and urges get stronger and stronger. And I think the really, the hard part about this for humans is that and people that are, I'm, I'm not in recovery myself, so tell me if I'm wrong about this, but just that feeling of having these urges throughout the day multiple times and seeing yourself not be able to stop it and watching yourself use, it like just kills your self-confidence. Because we walk around in society and we're like responsible for our actions, we're supposed to do stuff and get praised, etc. So to like have all day where you feel these things arising in you and you can't stop them and you watch yourself do the behavior, it's just very like demoralizing. And so to live like that and to be in that shame, am I right about that? Okay, because I'm not saying that in lectures and I'm like, I really need to check with someone. Because there's literature to suggest that the shame comes from these primitive areas. And so they're thinking that active addiction biologically activates shame. So even if you like think yourself, this is not a you know moral failing, I know it's a disease. Your family says that, your school says that, your society says that. Just the act of feeling this inside yourself is going to create shame. And the antidote to shame is empathy. So shame is feeling like something's broken with you and like something's wrong with you and you literally need another person to hear it and then go, oh, that's not a big deal or oh, other people go through that because when we're in shame, we literally think we're the only person in the world, right? And, and like, we've all done this, like I yelled at my child last week and I was really upset at myself and like, like if it like to see her little face crumples and yell, it just like, oh. And we all have personal experiences like that and nobody talks about it. Maybe you talk to them to your therapist or your loved one, but just in general, we have all these private emotional experiences and like no one's talking about it. 
And so when, when I think about addiction, it's often people who are sensitive and self-medicating and those things bother them and they get in this spiral and then they're downward and then there's already shame inside them biologically and then we put more on drugs and we shame them more and so it's just this like constant spiral downward. Can you talk about the difference between men and women in terms of boys or women developing later? Um, yeah, so... Or maybe there's <laughs> Um, I don't know 100% because I'm an adult psychiatrist, so I don't know all the time about adolescent stuff as well. What's interesting with women is that um, they're more likely to start using because of a partner, and then there's this thing called telescoping, where their use will increase more quickly and they'll have more medical complications in a shorter time period than men. And they also, we also find that um, a lot of women stay in their social networks a lot longer, whereas men end up kind of being retreat or kind of like losing social networks. So I just, we just got to keep going so we can wrap up quick. Yes, so I just want to get... Uh, by the way, look, don't you like how I interrupt you and then I say, please be quick, I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. I just want to plug our agency, Partners in Prevention. Yeah. And uh, again, it kept coming up, the idea of parental involvement. We have a fantastic program called Strengthening Families, which really helps parents, because this is a difficult subject to discuss. It's not easy to sort of broach this topic with you. So strengthening families really speaks to um, helping families better communicate, and it really targets the other like age. Said, it's helping families communicate. Exactly. Because, what Dr. Zerbo said, it's, it's yes, not a one-off, it's, it's involving the family. Exactly. All right, Mar Marco. Thank you. So no, thank you. What should you tell the family? What advice would you have? Yeah, first things first, I would say, uh, doctor, is a treasure trove of information. Thank you for all that, and especially everyone up here. Yeah, shout out to Mark. Um, <laughs> just chase your recovery like you chase those drugs out there. And um, if you want to speak to the kids and, and reach out to them, you, you have to go to where they go. You have to so I, they I love what you said, chase your recovery. So what does that mean? Does it mean get more information to go to Aisha's point? Absolutely. Get more information. Um, not to talk about the past, but the whole time that I was in the addiction, I was I didn't let it stop my education. I took every experience educational, and I figured out what it was, how it was made, when it was made, what it's for, and it's just everyone. Like like she said, uh, you know, when you're in shame, you feel like you're the only one. Um, I just felt like for me, a drug dealer to now a drug user, everyone was just happy for me that I was down and um, I, I had no time for pity. And and tell them what you're going to be doing now. Starting college. Amen. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Governor. No, no, no. no. Lisa. Hi. Oh, thank you, Pastor. Pastor. Yeah, you better thank Pastor Flores. So family, I think that just being on the panel and being um, here with a lot of, um, of you that are in the prevention um, area of the continuum is different from where um, I'm at, which is great when we all work together. Um, I've always worked on the treatment side and I've worked a lot with teens. I think that having the family um, really, uh, we have to understand that addiction is not only a brain disease, but it's also a family disease. And that's something that's really overlooked by pretty much treatment. Wait, that again, um, addiction is a, not only a brain disease, but also a family disease. Sure. And you. yeah, and it's something that's overlooked, I think, pretty much throughout the continuum of care and throughout the country. And I think we really need to work on um, really looking at how to get families to understand and gain insight into what their roles may be in this and addiction. And how it complicates the dynamic. Correct, yeah. And then, no, thank you. And then for um, the community purpose, it's kind of like, let's start looking at each other like we're also family. Um, I remember, you know. Let's go to Robin's point about, you know, sports and right. family and activities. And just really watch over each other and stuff. But I, I definitely feel like we have to really understand the family piece. And it's not just going to be all about processing feelings about how we feel. It's going to be actually about kind of seeing it, conceptualizing it, and really understanding thank how that dynamic affects Lisa, thank you for all you do with New Bridge, with New Jersey Reentry, and working with our clients. We're really grateful. So thank Thanks, you. No, thank you. Kevin, great Kevin. So when it, when it comes to family, I feel that the, the families, before you speak to your kids about drugs, you need to be educated on yourself. You need to be educated on addiction, 
Um, and speaking from experience, when I came and I let my parents know what I was doing, my father had to get up and walk away. And just, I don't get it. I don't get it. Um, and the more you, just like anything else in this world, the more you educate yourself, the better you equipped you are to deal with it, to understand it, and to help with it. So I think education is definitely a key for the parents. Uh, I know for myself, I have an advantage. By being somebody in recovery, I definitely have an advantage for when I did talk to my son about it. Because I, I, I was just honest with him. He was about 14, and I was honest with what I did, where, where it led me, all the different jails and different treatments. And, and it's a lot easier for me to communicate with him about it. Where uh, a parent who's never used drugs has a, it's, it's going to have a harder time because they've never did it. They don't know the experience. Yeah, it's anymore. hard, right? Exactly. I, I, I dealt with, you know, families who, like, God bless them. Like, they don't know what to do. Right. To them, it's like, it's, it's, it's like, it's an interstellar experience. Right. You must have talked to my parents then, because that's what it was. <laughs> but, you know, like, uh, so but, but I mean, it's the purposes of today, and, right. you know, Mayor Davis and all of us, and from my issue to, to Dr. Zerbo from Aaron, is to reach out to people, and, and frankly, God willing, wake them up that they realize they have, I don't need to, an obligation to do what you said, Kevin, is to educate yourself. Right. Yes, educate, and, and the fact that the communities are, uh, like the doctor was saying before, people are being more educated. Being more educated, the, the doctors are more understanding, uh, describing the, the yeah. medications now. That I still think we got a long way to go, but I agree with you. Absolutely, but we got a long way. Yeah, just the needle, like she said, the needle's finally moving. Yeah, Jen. So I think it's. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, it's really important to use. Uh, the community resources that we have available. Hudson County has some amazing resources. Um, our organization, Partners in Prevention, like James mentioned, that sure. program is, is free. It's a program that's uh, helping parents in this very overwhelming, uh, difficult uh, conversation. Um, so using programs like that, um, I just want to mention another program for Care Plus. It's not connected with prevention, but um, it is something that our organization promotes. It's a, a program that is a support program for uh, families that are working, that have uh, some, a member in their family that is going through treatment. Um, so that program is specifically- So use the resources that are available. Family, yeah. Frank? Frank is out there every day. Well, uh, you know, you talk about addiction and most people have an idea in their mind what addiction is or what an addict is. And, you know, part of what I like to say is change. If I had to say one thing to a child, an adolescent, a family member, a community member, change the way you think. What we do is based upon how we think. So in part of our treatment, in most of our treatment, all of our treatment, we train the mind, we test the body, we lift the soul. So it's a mind, body, spiritual disease. You have to hit all three of those facets, but it's changing the way you think. Think about, we are an addictive society. We're a society of consumption. So if we don't change the way we think, then our behavior is not going to change. So it's changing addictive thinking as much as it is changing yeah. the act of using the substance. Thank you. I just want to see if anybody has any questions. Please feel free to come up if anybody has any questions. Does Dr. Zerbo remind me? I'm getting so immersed in this. I'm like, I've got to ask that question now. Um, but I agree with what you said, Frank. You know, this is why I tell uh, Rob Bart all the time. It's, it's the joys of just doing reentry. Don't worry about the paycheck. It's just, um, Rob? Um, yeah, I was just going to say, let's continue events like this, let's keep talking about it, let's keep trying, and let's take the stigma out of it. There's no shame, it is a disease model, let's chase the science, let's work on best practices. Well, what do you think about what Dr. Zerbo said, which I never thought about until tonight, that there's almost an inherent shame response on the part of the person. I mean, uh, Governor Christie used to talk about all the time about shame of society. But I never thought about the, the fact, and it seems so readily evident once you said it, that there's almost a person, him or herself, triggers a shameful response, which is only exacerbated when that's reflected in society. And then it's just, 
down, I, I used to shake your head, it's the, the downward spiral. We, we heard a great example years ago at the state. They said addiction is not a casserole disease. Somebody has cancer or somebody loses a loved one, we show up with a casserole, we give empathy, we give sympathy. Somebody's going through addiction, it's something where there's still shame, there's still stigma, we don't want to talk about it. God forbid we tell anybody and share anybody what we're going through, because it's not a casserole disease. It needs to be a normal conversation. It's part of all of our lives. None of us are unscathed. I'm a professional. I can tell you many instances in my personal life, in my personal family, we've been unscathed. It is applicable to everybody. Let's keep talking about it. Let's not be ashamed. Let's continue to work on it because it won't go away unless we have that acceptance that we have to look at it as disease with acceptance. So we, we talk about, Aisha talks about, you know, sort of open communication. Marco talks about, you know, and I love what she said about best practices. Lisa talks about the, the challenges of treatment. Kevin said, you know, by the way, I resonate with your father. Um, but the, the, the point is, is that you have to be educated, right? You have to have an affirmative responsibility to be educated. And that's a, who am I to say, but I think it's a, a legitimate expectation. And then talks about the importance of community services. And Frank goes earlier, talks about that, you know, fentanyl and everything. When Robin says, you know, we have these communications. So, Rob, going through that litany, if I'm still out there, I don't know what to do, can they call you? Yes. They can call me. But uh, um, we talked a lot about addiction today, and I had a deal with it for two seconds. I just wanted to talk about prevention. So like before, before the pandemic hit, I was able to go into high schools and speak to juniors and seniors with the fellowship and a member of a full auditoriums like this. And like Alex said, as soon as I started talking, or people started talking about heroin in jail and prison, like the phones came out, heads go down, and that's it, and you lose them. So what, what I always like to talk about, you know, to, to always grab their attention is how I used to feel when I was in high school, like getting picked up, and wanting to fit in, and wanting to experiment. Like that identification piece resonates way more than any type of scare tactic. So like, you know, I would always meet a group of club students that would stay after and they would talk about friends that have issues or whatever, you know? So like, if I, I mean, if perhaps we don't even have to get to the, to the aspect of talking about neurotransmitters and all this other stuff, maybe if the parents would, would talk to a little bit about their kids about how they felt in high school or issues that they went through to let them know that like, regardless of the age group or they, when they grew up, they identified with those feelings. You know, you're telling me, like, that's what led me, you know, it's every single person I've ever used with some type of feeling, whether it be, whatever, embarrassment or, or not feeling good enough or wanting to fit in or whatever, you know, I was living in different experiences. But that, I mean, if you want to talk a little about prevention and not just dealing with the addiction, it was strong. Like, that, like, that's the biggest response I've got from all the high school students that I deal with, just really looking at and talking about day-to-day -day high school life and what it's like to be a teenager and fit in and, and what people will do when it starts with the jewelry out I'm sorry, I don't speak to you. And thank you, Rob. And, and we're going to wrap up with, um, and, and by the way, Dr. Zerbo, you know, she's a big shot, but now she has the gold standard. She's got, she's got, a, she's got the Marco, Marco approval. Um, you know, very informative. But yeah, I just want to say thank you to my dear friend. Facebook Live and to work for us, but because to go back to what Robin said, this is a conversation. To go back to what Frank said, the reality is, in terms of fentanyl, things have become uh, much more difficult. And so this conversation itself is so much more important. And with that, our concluding thoughts from uh, Dr. Aaron Zerbo. Well, I love what Rob said so much just now, and I think that's the exact thing. Like, Oh, no, no, you know, it's really scary. Marco's endorsing Zerbo, and now Dr. Zerbo's endorsing Rob. I mean, the, the whole panel went to hell. Excuse me, in the last 30 seconds. I just want to thank you for your input between me and between two brilliant individuals to make me look even dumber than I already am. Such a good stuff. Because I think that whole thing is when you're like, you know, jail, this, and you could, you, you're like jumping to the end of the road, and nobody that started uses this us for the first time says, I'm going to be addicted and give up everything and go down. I'm like, no, like that. So that's totally unconnected with your current experience. So then that makes perfect sense that the phones come out and all that. And that's my whole point is like, let's concentrate on the inner emotional state of people and rather, like, as a psychiatrist, I'm treating the emergency room. Someone can come in, be experiencing homelessness. They, they have no place to sleep that night. And I'm literally like, how many bags of heroin did you use? Did you 
Did you inject it? Blah, blah, blah. And then we're like, okay, we're discharging you. You don't need cricket. And this person has no place to sleep at night. Right? So, like, there's so many places in our society where we just, like, boxed ourselves into a weird corner just from culture over a long period of time. And that's what's happened with drugs. Because if you look back at every culture that we've ever studied, substances are always present and they're used for sacred reasons, recreational reasons, they're misused. Like, humans and substances go together. So this whole war on drugs is actually a war on people, and it's made all of us terrified and upset and fearful and all this criminal stuff, and we just have to say enough is enough. We've had a pandemic, we can't do this crap anymore, like, we've just gotta be over. And the reason people are using things is because of those feelings underneath. So if they can say, I used this because I felt lonely or I felt this, it's like, who cares what was going on? It's like, what's the feeling underneath it? And that's the stuff we have to dive into with our kids. And instead, if you hear that they like smoked marijuana or cannabis for the first time and you're picturing them in jail, you're not gonna be able to have a helpful conversation with them, right? And cannabis especially, it's literally the, one of the safest substances we have. It's way safer than alcohol. So even the fact that that was illegal in our state up until very recently, right? Just everything doesn't make sense. So I really encourage you to do your own research, to look. Um, the, the Global Drug Policy Commission is this amazing international organization that talks about legalizing drugs and, and the harms of drug policy. And then in New Jersey, there's a wonderful organization, Families for Sensible Drug Policy, um, and that's fdsp.org. And that organization um, like looks at a family-centered approach and tries to push policies harm reduction-wise to help families that are struggling with substance use. So there's like lots of stuff out there. I just really encourage people to kind of open their minds and, and read about it. And there's also countries that have taken very different approaches. I mean, you look to Portugal, you look to other nations that, frankly, some people would say the Portuguese have done it um, very, very well. So I, I just wanted to say thank you. I want to say thank you to Reverend Flores, who not only serves as our Director of Outreach, but now our film photographer uh, on behalf of New Jersey Reentry. But I thought this was a great conversation. I thought this was wonderful. So can we give ourselves a round of applause? Uh, thank you very much. And just really thank you. And I, we're going to put all the information from each of the individual groups um, up on the Bayonne Board of Education, up on the Bayonne City of Bayonne site, and we're going to share that also with NJRC. And again, I just wanted to thank the panelists. I mean, you each contributed, uh, as well as Alex, each contributed from your own vantage point, and you contributed, hopefully, in helping families and young people grapple with the realities of the circumstances that to promote healthy, healthy lives. So thank you very much. Have a good evening, everyone.